lying about it, but I'm really going to, I really believe I've got it cut down tonight. Uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you that you brought us here. I thank you, Father, for all who shared tonight and all who were encouraged by it, myself included, Lord. I pray, Father, we would continue along in that vein since it is your word to us to stir each other up, to incite each other in love and in good deeds. Bless this night, Father. Speak to us through this word. For we ask this in Jesus' precious name and all my dear brothers and sisters say, Amen. Amen. All right, praise God. Psalm 41 is actually the last psalm in the first book of five books of psalms. I mean, in case you didn't know, it was broken up in that way. Uh, since it was collected over hundreds of years, uh, this is uh, the closing of book one. These books have been referred to as Israel's uh, uh, hymn, hymnal. Israel's hymnal is what it's been called. So this is the end of the first book, and, and I'll point out where that happens. All right, here's where we are for this particular Psalm 41. It kind of goes like this. Here's the intro. David, King David, has a wonderful counselor. His favorite counselor. Been with him for a lot of years. His name is Ahithophel, which is easy to say, especially if you have a lisp. <laughs> His name is Ahithophel. And Ahithophel is a very smart man. Uh, when he speaks, it was like gold to David. I mean, this guy, just as though he was speaking from God, this is how great this counselor was. And in such a mighty way, he was used by God for David. Ahithophel has a granddaughter. Ahithophel's granddaughter is a very pretty, lovely gal by the name of Bathsheba. Yes, it's that Bathsheba. Which would mean that Ahithophel's son-in-law is Uriah the Hittite, who was married to Bathsheba. David, of course, we know the story, sees Bathsheba taking a bath, <laughs> and he cannot contain himself. He manipulates the situation so that she's with him. He sends orders to one of his captains to pull back, to send Uriah in and to pull back his troops so that Uriah would die. So David is an adulterer and a murderer. He keeps it quiet for about a year. And all that time he's tortured in his conscience. And finally, the prophet Nathan goes in and says, you're the guy. Everybody finds out. The cat's out of the bag. The beans are spilled, as they say. Now, if you might imagine what Ahithophel's response to all of this might be. And it was an intense anger. For some of you here who are grandparents, tell me what would it be like if somebody messed with your grandkids? You know? I may be old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> and Ahithophel has something that he's got to work through, doesn't he? Just like we all have to work through things when we're hurt, right? Uh, a brother called me with something that had happened. And uh, I said, oh my gosh, how are you doing working through that? And he says, what do you mean working through it? And I said, bro, you're going to have to get to a place of forgiving that person. How are you doing at working through that? And you know how sometimes we have to work through things in order to get to a place of forgiveness? Well, Ahithophel, as smart as he is, and knowing that God has forgiven David, although David is told there's going to be severe consequences within his house for the rest of his life, and there were, the sword never departed from David's house. His kids run amok. It was just terrible a matter of reaping what he had sown. And uh, I think this was probably part of it. Ahithophel was not able to forgive David. How many of you know that forgiveness is a tremendous force for good? Anybody here know that? And let me ask this. Forgiveness can not only let the person go who's been wronged, 
but it can let the person who did the wrong go, right? So Jeannie and I were watching a show last night, and it's one of those imports from England, and they interviewed a couple of gentlemen. Uh, the first fellow that they interviewed, he seemed very uptight. He was kind of nervous. He, you know, he looked a little uncomfortable. Uh, he was being told that somebody who had wronged him back when he was in grade school now wanted to reconnect with him after 34 years and apologize to him. And uh, uh, would you be willing to meet with that guy? And uh, he was kind of like, well, <clears throat> you know, you could tell he was noticing a little flush in the face. And uh, he said, well, do you know what that guy did to me? And he went on to talk about the intense uh, rousing that he had gotten, uh, the intense beatings that he has gotten, the things that were thrown at him, the gangs of other kids that he had gotten together. And he goes, and it wasn't just a few times, it was from age six until age 16 where I left school and I would sit on my bed and I would cry and I would think this day's gonna be horrible, I wish I was dead, why am I going in? And he would go in and they would just, he was bullied that bad. The fellow who was in charge of the bullying now, 34 years later, is uh, they interviewed him and he has just uh, got a conscience that is killing him. And uh, he cannot rest, he cannot sleep, he is uh, uh, now looking at his own children. <laughs> and uh, they showed him being interviewed at his house. And uh, while he was sitting at the kitchen table, there was a chalkboard behind him. And on the chalkboard, there was a triangle. And going up this way, it, uh, it, had, it had something written on each one of the sides of the triangles. And on this side, it says carnal. And on this side, it said spiritual. And across the bottom, it said choices. And so I'm thinking to myself, even though they didn't go into it, I'm thinking this guy's giving his life to Christ. And now he's thinking, oh my gosh, what did I do back then? And he's teaching his kids about fleshly and spiritual choices in their life. So the guy who had been bullied says, well, okay, I'll, I'll meet with him. And I'll hear what he has to say. But I will not forgive him. Uh, I won't. And he was adamant about it. And he went to the fellow then. The, 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 the psychologist goes to the house of the guy that uh, wants to go and apologize. And he's, uh, he says, uh, well, uh, one, of the reason, one of the things the guy wanted to answer was why. Why me? Why, why me? Why did you pick on me? What was about me? That me? And now he's married and has a couple of kids too. So uh, they agree to meet. Uh, he's told that the guy's not going to forgive you. He goes out to meet him. They meet on a pier. And... Uh, he walks, he walks right up to him and you're just like, either this guy is going to turn around and, you know, with a right hook. It seemed like he was that angry, you know. The guy says, I've been, ever since I was 16 years old, I've been battling anger. And I have a terrible anger. And I, I, I have to control my anger all the time. And so he really did a number on this guy, you know, that he had bullied. So uh, he gets up, and he, uh, so they meet, and he says, well, maybe we can sit down. Can we, can we sit down? I, 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 I'd like to, t I want to talk to you, the guy. And he's very humble, very broken. They sit down. They start talking, and, and uh, back and forth they go. And, and uh, the guy says, are you okay now? And the guy is like, yeah, I'm fine. And how about you? And the guy says, I, I feel tortured by my, by my own conscience. And I'm sorry, and please forgive me. And then he goes, can you forgive me? There's this long pause. And the guy goes, I forgave you the moment I saw your face. And I saw that hurt on your face. And the softness on your face. And I forgive you. And both these guys, at, the, at that instant, their faces changed, didn't they? The guy with the tortured conscience, all of a sudden he looked younger, you know? And the other guy, afterwards, 
he kind of had a, a smile on his face. And then they were talking to them afterwards, and he goes, boy, my, I feel like I've just got a brand new start in life. I feel like, like things are going to change now and be different. And all just because of that. There's tremendous power in forgiveness, and God knows it. And there's tremendous pain in unforgiveness. This happened 34 years ago, but you could still see what the effects that it was having. And if it was having an effect on him, it was having an effect on his kids and on and on, right? So even if somebody does something creepy, what do we need to do? Forgive them. <laughs> it sets you free as much as it sets them free as well. So Ahithophel was unable to forgive David, and he comes up in this psalm. Want to see it? It's very cool. Uh, psalm 41, it says, To the chief musician, which means class. Everybody sang the song in church. A psalm of David. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. I'm telling you, you can circle that as a promise from God to you. Uh, the Lord, throughout the scriptures, a number of times talks about poor and needy. And that they're on God's heart and mind. And I believe that God will even step in and touch his own kids so and use them to help somebody who's struggling. So don't ever discount that God will use your life to bless somebody else. In particular, when we get to James in the New Testament, we find out that the group in particular that God is interested in or has a special heart for, two groups, the widows and the fatherless. Orphans and widows. So it would be wise since we find out right here that the one who considers the poor, God will deliver him in time of trouble. It'd be wise on your part if you're looking around every now and then for a widow or an orphan. Amen? <laughs> and then find some way to bless them. It's, it's, it blesses them. God uses you to bless them. But it also then gets the attention of the Lord as far as you're concerned. I mean, that's important. All right, let me say this other part. In this psalm, David is casting himself in the part of the poor. So you've got to understand that. So David is telling the Lord, Blessed is he who considers the, Lord, considers the poor, that's me, little old David, for the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble, which makes it also a prayer of faith. David is saying, Lord, you're going to save me. That's what he's saying. Verse 2, the Lord will preserve him, me, you could say, and keep me, or David, alive. He will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. Wouldn't you like those promises to be yours? I mean, I certainly would. And so I, I think each one of us needs to slip this particular prayer on as belonging to you personally. Okay, I'm going to take this, Lord. This is mine. David then here is speaking of his own illness, of his own trouble, of his own uh, difficulties. So what happened was Ahithophel turns against David and he starts helping David's son out, Absalom, to take over the kingdom. That's what has happened here. So we're going to see something very interesting happen. Watch this. It's very cool. David then says, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. So he's not talking just about a physical problem. He's talking about the very core of his soul needs healing. Anybody ever have a soul that needs healing? That would be all of us every day. Every day. <laughs> the soul is the seat of the mind and the will and the emotions. Anybody need a healing in those areas? Okay. Uh, he's asking for healing there. Uh, verse 6. And if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself when he goes out he tells it. Okay, I have to kind of introduce something here that's really fascinating because starting in verse 6, 
He's not only talking about people that are visiting him in his sickness, his illness, his trouble, his depression, but he's also talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and Judas Iscariot. Isn't that interesting? Watch, you're going to see how this happens. But the first thing I want to tell you is, <laughs> David is saying, uh, I, he's, so David says, hey, I'm in trouble, and some people that I know, when they see me face to face, they're all smiles and sunshine, and get better, and man, you're something. But when they leave, they tell a different story. You got that? You see what that's what's happening in verse 6? Okay, verse 7. All who hate me whisper together against me. I mean, this is really, this is really a hurt, hurtful. Against me, they devised my hurt. But again, remember that I'm telling you that this has something to do with Jesus Christ and Judas Iscariot. Do you remember how the Pharisees and Judas, they kind of plotted, plotted together uh, how to capture Jesus and how to arrest him and when to do it and when he was alone and when nobody else was around and for 30 pieces of silver, right? Okay. An evil disease, they say, clings to him and now he lies down he will rise up no more. So I'm going to look at that in a dual way. Number one, we're looking at it as David. And they're saying, oh, nana, 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 he's in big trouble. And that's it for him. David's on his sick bed and he's a dead duck. That's what they're saying about him. In Christ's case, the religious leaders of the day, including Judas Iscariot, are saying of Jesus, he's gone too far. He's saying all the wrong things. He thinks he's the son of God. He's a blasphemer. He's cutting into our business, you know. So he's going, he's going down. And, and he's not going to rise up again. Is that right or wrong? <laughs> That's wrong, both for Jesus and uh, David, huh? Even my own familiar friend. Now to David, that would be Ahithophel. To Jesus, that would be Judas, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread. Now, are you remembering? Does this sound like the uh, what we call the Last Supper? Has lifted up his heel against me. Fascinating. So you say, Pastor Paul, how in the world do you know that that is about Jesus and Judas? Because Jesus tells us that it's about Jesus and Judas. John chapter 13, verse 18, Jesus said, I do not speak concerning all of you, the 12. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. And then he quotes this very verse. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Isn't that amazing? That you look at this and you would not recognize the fact that this is an actual prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, Judas had to betray me in order to fulfill the scriptures, which tells us a couple of things. Number one, when God says something, what? He does it. He does it. <laughs> we listen because he does it. <laughs> it's settled. It's done. Every bit of God's word that he said is going to come to pass. You can count on it, you know? Put faith in it. Uh, it also tells us here that uh, since Jesus is revealing this, it tells us that the New Testament truths are hidden within the Old Testament. And it is a wise person who's willing to dig into the scriptures and ferret out these true things about Jesus that were written about him 3,000 years before he actually even said it. So that's just fascinating to me. Verse 10. But you, Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up. So we have to say in regards to Jesus, that refers to resurrection, that I may repay them. Uh, that's a resurrection verse right there if I ever saw one. Verse 11. By this, I know that you are well pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. I 
thought about that a while, and here's what I think verse 11 is saying. Uh, remember they said, David's laying down and he's not going to get back up? Okay. David is now saying, well, they were saying, neener, neener, neener. Now David is saying, same thing. I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still alive. The enemy has not triumphed over me. It's kind of like that funny joke from old where the guy quoted says, uh, the rumors of my demise, what, Mike? The rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> That's what verse 11 says. Verse 12, as for me, you, Lord, uphold me in my integrity. That is... Uh, Fascinating how David does that. Uh, since, to be honest with you, I look at my own life and, and I think, oh my gosh, there's so many ways in which I fall short, so many ways in which I'm not Jesus. Anybody here? But anyway, that I, I don't, I know David prays this. Lord, you uphold me in my integrity. You show that I'm right by my integrity. Well, I tell you, uh, well, you know, I struggle with that because I'll tell you what. Me, I'm totally, if anything, I am a trophy of God's grace. I'm this trophy that God says, you know, the enemy goes, oh my gosh, that guy should be wiped out and he did what's wrong. And the Lord goes, no, he's mine. All because of grace. Not because of anything earned or credited to me. So, uh, but David likes to pray that and God bless you, David. Uh and set me before your face forever. And that's what happens through salvation. Verse 13 does not belong to Psalm 41. How do you like that? Huh? Verse 13 is the closing doxology of the first book of the five books of, of Psalms. And successively, every time we come to a closing of another book, we will see a doxology that looks very much like verse 13 and it has this key phrase in it. Amen and amen. <laughs> yeah, my dad used to say that sometimes. <laughs> I think of my dad when I hear that. Amen and amen, Paul. <laughs> say yes, dad. <laughs> I'd shake his head like that. Verse 13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. That closes out the... First book there. Okay. Verse uh, chapter 42. Chapter 42 is very familiar to a lot of us. As we get into it, a couple of verses will click in as being a reminder to you. And I just mentioned my dad. And Psalm 42 was one of his favorite psalms as well as Psalm 1. But he really liked Psalm 42 as well. Uh, this is God coming to your rescue in a time of distress when you are unable to help yourself. I like that. Do you understand that? That God can come to your rescue when there's absolutely nothing that you can do for yourself? In fact, he uses a terminology in here where David says that he's cast down. I'm cast down. So we think of it today and we think, oh, somebody took a good hit and they fell over. Kind of like that old commercial from way back. Help, I've fallen and I can't get up, right? <laughs> so you can eat that button or whatever that you press that it sends somebody to help you but this is a shepherd's term and to be cast down was a term that referred to a sheep and just before shearing happens the sheep have you seen the sheep that are just like ready to be sheared they're just so fat and fluffy and way out to here like this they look like a big giant butterball well what happens to a cast sheep is they'll be out in the morning and the dew begins to rest on the sheep. And if enough dew rests on top of a big fluffy sheep, they get top heavy. And they get so top heavy that they just topple over. And because they're so big, there's their little legs kicking, but they can't right themselves. They can't right themselves, so they're stuck there. Unless a shepherd comes along and helps them, they're dead. They'll just stay there until they die. So David is saying, in effect, I, the weight on my back, the weight on my shoulders, the things in life have collected upon me to the point where I've fallen over and I can't get up. I cannot, I cannot right myself. 
And sometimes somebody who's depressed or too many difficulties come upon them and they just, you know, they pile up so much that they just cannot right themselves anymore. And that's the kind of thing that he's talking about. We'll see it. Psalm 42, to the chief musician, meaning everybody sings this one. It is a contemplation, or in the Hebrew, a misgil, which means that it is a teaching psalm. We're supposed to be able to pull out some principles out of here that we can apply directly to our own lives. A contemplation of the sons of Korah. So this looks like a psalm not written by David. How do you like that? And if you're at all familiar with the Old Testament, you look at the sons of Korah and you say, hold the phone just a minute. Aren't the sons of Korah the ones who led a rebellion against Moses? Anybody remember this? And what happened to them? <laughs> For sure it did. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you, here, there's a couple, there's a few people in the scriptures that I, that I have this to say about. If you're on any kind of, 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 a, of a sporting event whatsoever, and either Moses or David is on the other team, you might as well just give up right then. Whatever team they're on, you want to be on their team. They just, you know, the, they, God's hand was on them, and that was the end of the story. So the sons of Korah came along. They said, we can do anything better than Mo We can do anything, anything Moses can do. We can do better. <laughs> and uh, that, of course, that was untrue. And, and the Lord showed that. But it showed that the descendants of Korah were still blessed by God and used by God. So somebody can't come along then and say, oh, well, it's my parents. They did all these terrible things. No, no, no. <laughs> God deals with each person individually and directly. So... Uh, the sons of Korah get a psalm in here, and they say, As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. I'm going to go down to verse 5. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they continually say to me, remember he's cast down, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise. With a multitude that kept a pilgrim's feast. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. A few years ago, actually it was a lot of years ago now. I was listening to K-Wave and uh, a lady came on and uh, she says to uh, Pastor Chuck, uh, are there any places, any people in the Bible uh, who were depressed? And that was Chuck's response. He chuckled. Chuck chuckled at that question. And uh, I believe his response w was to her was, you should be asking the question, are there any people in the Bible who were not depressed? <laughs> <laughs> So being down is a human condition. David, as we've seen through the Psalms, seems to ride this roller coaster, doesn't he? I'm so glad that, that the Lord recorded David's troubles. Otherwise, I would think, well, I would think nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> but apparently David did, and then some, and the Lord was with him through the whole thing. So uh, we're all in that boat together. Uh, this psalm then has something to say for all of us. Look at that verse 1 again. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. David was a shepherd out in the wilderness. When we think of wilderness, sometimes we think of sequoia you know, trees and uh, waterfalls and running brooks. But that's not it at all. The wilderness of uh, David's uh, locale was uh, desert. <laughs> uh, 
uh, you know, and dry. And I can imagine David seeing every now and then a staggering deer uh, looking for water. Jeannie, what's it like up in Cambria when the deer have no water? Yeah, yeah, right there, right there in Northern California. So uh, uh, what he's saying is, he goes, I have seen deer staggering with just like, give me some water, you know, please, somewhere. Looking here and there and not knowing if they're going to make it with their ribs poking out, like you said, with their kids and worried. And David is saying, God... When I think of you, I'm like a deer that is staggering in the wilderness looking for a drink of water. What is it that you stagger for? What is your soul thirsty for? What do you think that you could so fill yourself with in this world that you'd be satisfied? Because there's a lot of people out there in the world that are staggering for things that do not satisfy, that do not fulfill, that leave you emptier than you would have been without it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like the person who is on a raft out in the ocean and has no water and gets to a point where they began to drink the salt water and they die from that. And I look at this and I think to myself, oh God, make me somebody with a soul that pants after you to be filled with Christ that it is really Christ who I need I need Jesus I need his living water nothing else is going to fulfill me sometimes we think oh it's the mate that's going to make me whole it's the house that's going to make me whole it's the bank account that's going to make me whole and it does not it does not it is history people's lives testimonies all prove that that is not true we need christ and as he's looking back and he's lamenting and he goes man i remember the times when i used to go with the multitude and i went to the house of god and we had the voice of joy and praise and with a multitude we kept the pilgrim's feast you know if you get a hold of in your life the idea that these are God's people and that God has not randomly planted you with this group of people, but you have been specifically planted by God with the group of people. You are meant to grow with them. And don't take it lightly, like I could take it or leave it or whatever, whatever. You know, that's no way to live out your Christian life. You'll never really get your roots in. You'll never really grow until you decide to grow where it is that God has planted you and with the people that God has called you to be planted with because there is a joy in that. You know, I've counseled, uh, you know, marriage counseling before and, and uh, you know, one or the other one has a wandering eye or whatever, you know, or looking for fulfillment some other place. And, and, and I think to myself, if that person would just commit to where they're at, <laughs> all that stupid wasted energy and the heartache that's going to come with it afterwards would be gone. This is who you are. You are married. <laughs> you know? Now find the joy in the relationship. I mean, you must have got married for some reason. Where's the joy? Go dig it up. Go find it. Go after it. And it's the same way with the Lord. God has called you into relationship with him, not so that he can work you to death so you try to keep the law. God has brought you into relationship with him so that you can enjoy being in love with God. And sometimes we even as Christians forget that. That I can have absolute joy with being with God. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. You can get up in the morning completely right on to say, God, let's have some fun today. You and me, God. You're my friend. We're together. Holy Spirit, I love you. Let's, let's do this thing together. Rather than always trying to look for something out there to fill and satisfy, what a waste of time. They, they call a person like that a mugwomp. You know what a mugwomp is? That's the guy who sits on a fence and he's got his mug on one side and his womp on the other. 
Yeah, yeah, Mike. I have a question about verse three, um, where it says, "My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, where is your God?'" Is it the tears that are saying that? No, I, it's his enemies, people around him oh, that okay. think that uh, it's like. Uh, I mean, what a sad thing to have tears as your food, but these are people who say, "Oh, you're a Christian." Well, you know, why'd your wife have cancer four times? You're a Christian? How come you just got laid off? You're a Christian? How come you struggle with drugs and alcohol? Where's your God? You know? Wow, we, huh? Zowie, wowie. So he's all depressed about this. And uh, he says, uh, he, he, what he does is, he does this interesting thing where he actually counsels himself. He talks to himself. David talks to himself. He does. Do you, do you think that that's odd that somebody talks to themselves? This is, there's three, there's three stages of insanity. Stage one is when you talk to yourself. Stage two is where you argue with yourself. And stage three is where you lose the argument. You're, you're done. <laughs> So, so let's see what happens then. <laughs> Look, uh, one, one time there was a, a fellow who was a counselor and, and a very good counselor and a lot of people had been helped by him. And uh, he came to me one time with a particular problem and he goes, I just cannot resolve this. I don't know why. I, keep, I know the scriptures and I know that he knew the scriptures. And I keep doing, falling into this and I don't know why I do that. And I said, I have a great idea for you. I want you to, to uh, I said, let's pray about this right now. And I want you to pray about it. I want you to go into your office like you had a counseling appointment. And I want you to sit in your chair and say to the empty chair, now, why are you here today? And then I want you to get up and go to, the, to that chair and, and then answer the question. And then I want you to go back to your chair again and continue on the conversation. He actually did it. He came back and he thanked me. Then he felt like God was there right with him. And of course, after a while, he quit switching chairs back and forth. And uh, <laughs> I visit him every Tuesday. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but haven't you ever, haven't you ever uh, encouraged yourself? Haven't you ever said, come on, man. You know, let's come on. Buck up, little soldier. Come on, let's, you know, don't do that. That's, so, you know, uh, sometimes I'll say to myself, that's not like you. <laughs> you know, I'm doing something contrary to who God has called me to be. Then I'll actually tell myself, that's not like you. Quit being that. So we can counsel ourselves. And I believe that we can counsel ourselves to be depressed you ever counseled yourself to be depressed or talk to somebody who counsels themselves to be depressed? They have such self, self-talk. They always go, woe is me. I can't believe it. This keeps happening to me. This is wrong. I can't believe I'm so dumb. And they just keep digging a pit and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And when you find yourself digging a pit, what's the very first thing you should do? Stop digging. <laughs> So that's the very first thing you do when you're digging a pit. You stop digging. So David is trying to stop the digging right here. Yes, he's down. Yes, he's hurt. Yes, he's depressed. And uh, he's disappointed. And people are saying, where's your God? And that's what Ahithophel was saying to David, I think. Where's your God? Instead, he says, hope in God. Three things. Hope in God. I shall yet praise him. For the help of his countenance. Now look, he. what I like about David is that doesn't seem to be enough to get somebody out of trouble, does it? I mean, to get, really get out of trouble, it's give me a million dollars and, and uh, you know, <laughs> a trip to some place, uh, to Hawaii. <laughs> then I'll be out of my trouble. But he's saying, hope in God, praise God, and for the help of his countenance. Well, what's somebody's countenance? It's there. Yeah. It's the, what they give off when, when, yeah. when, when you're with them. Yes. So I see God with a smiling face. 
Absolutely, Mike. I'm right with you. All right. How, how, come on. Everybody here knows what it's like to be someplace and be nervous or something. Maybe you remember back in school or something. Or, and then to have a parent or a friend look at you and smile with that, come on, you can do it kind of a thing. You know, doesn't that just lift you up? I love it when my wife smiles at me, then I'm like, okay, you know, that's, you get a little bit of fuel there. Well, just think of it. David goes, what I want is a big smile from God. It kind of says, kind of says, you're okay. I got you. I'm with you. I know what's going on. I haven't left. I haven't forsaken you. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're my, I'm right with you. David said, I'm going to hope in God. I'm going to praise God. Notice how he says it. Yet praise him. What does that mean? Yet praise him. It's like even though is what that is. See, there has to be a conscious decision where I say, I stamp my foot down. And it's okay for you to go ahead and stand up and stamp your foot down and say, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to praise him. And for you to go and do it full on. Abs uh, here's a uh, definition of the word hope. Ready? Hope is the absolute expectation of coming good. That's what hope is. It's not a maybe because it's in God. It's the absolute expectation of coming good. Verse 6. Oh my God. My soul is cast down within me. Now he's not talking to himself. He now transfers and makes the prayer to God. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan and from the heights of Hermon and from the hill Mizar. You go, what in the world is Jordan, Hermon, and hill Mizar, you know? Uh, you know what this is saying? This psalmist is saying like this. You know what? I'm going to hope in God. I'm going to praise him. I'm waiting for his countenance to fall on me. Lord, my soul is down within me, but I'm remembering back in my life, God, you were there, and then you were there, and then you were there. You see how that works? Lord, you were with me in this hardship. You were with me in that trouble. And you're... So he's reminding himself that God is always with him. And then he says in verse 7, deep calls unto deep. At the noise of your waterfalls. You know, there's a verse that talks about God's voice. You wonder what God's voice sounds like. Uh, in uh, Revelation, it says it sounds like the sound of many waters. So he's, he's, uh, he's saying here, deep calls to deep. At the noise of your waterfalls, I take it to be God speaking. All your waves and billows have gone over me. In other words, I'm saying even the hardship that I've been involved in, God has been with me in that, and he has allowed that to happen for some reason. I don't know why. I may never know why. I may not know this side of heaven, why God allowed one thing to happen and not the other, and why this took place, and why I am where I may not know. But I never give up uh, what I do know for what I don't know. Never give up what you do know for what you don't know. So I'm always saying, well, what do I know? I know that God loves me. I know that I'm his son. I know that I'm saved by grace through faith, not of any merit of my own. I'm going to hang on to that tooth and nail. You, I'll be like a pit bull with a bone. You cannot get that truth out of me. That's me and that's who I am. Do you like this uh, terminology where he says deep calls to deep? It's kind of interesting because there's really no explanation here for it. And even if you search through the scriptures to try to find out what it means deep calls unto deep, it's very hard to pinpoint it. And I was trying to get some kind of a definition that I could give to you, and I could not come up with one. And then I sat back and I thought, well, I don't know what it means, but you know what? I think I know what it means. <laughs> I don't, I can't, I, I was having a hard time articulating it, but there's something inside me that knows what deep calls unto deep means. Even if I can't quite spell it out, here's the closest I could get to it. It means in my life, calling out from my deep to the Lord's deep. That there is something that is reaching 
God from deep within me that is able to touch his deep. Are you with me on that? <laughs> can you kind of, I don't think, I don't know if I can think of another word. Other, can you feel it? Can you feel that? Deep calls unto deep. That place of who I really am and what I'm really going through that nobody knows and nobody else can experience. Just me because I'm God. I'm God's child as an individual. And he takes that thing. And I know that there is that part of me that is way down dug deep inside that has something that it, when it cries out, it's able to reach across whatever it needs to reach across. And it's able to touch God's deep, deep within him. And I just love the sound of that. Deep calls unto deep. Oh, that's beautiful. Verse 8 says, The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. I, I had to stop. Look at that. <clears throat> this is the first time he uses the word Yahweh in this song. Yahweh will command his loving kindness. Did you like that? God looks at you. And because deep is called out to deep and you've been able to touch God, God then gives a command. Yahweh God, sovereign creator says, I command my loving kindness to you. Man, I'll tell you, you can just grab a hold of that in faith. It belongs to you. And in the night, his song shall be with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? This is not him asking. These, I believe, by the time he gets to verse 9, this is rhetorical. He's saying, okay, since all these other things are true, then why is it that you're doing this? Okay, you're done now. N knock it off. <laughs> why would I say to my rock, God, my rock, why would I, why would I even think that you've forgotten me? Or why would I think that I go around mourning? Verse 10, as a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? This is again, him absolutely pouring out his heart to God. Believe me, God's shoulders are big enough to take whatever it is you need to cast upon God. He says, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. It's not like he'll ever be surprised and say, I never knew you felt that way, Paul. He knows. Verse 11, why are you cast down then? I like to put that in there because I think that's the note that's being hit here. Then why are you cast down, my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Again, hope, praise, waiting for a smile from God. Psalm 43 is directly connected to Psalm 42 if it's not indeed a part of Psalm 42. I'm going to go through this quick. Hang on to your hats. It's only a few verses. Are you ready? Okay, ready, steady, go. Vindicate me. See how it just fits right in line? Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. And I believe he's talking about the nation taken over by Absalom. But I tell you, I would love for God to plead his case against this ungodly nation that has turned ungodly and that there would be a tremendous revival here. And I'd love it if it broke out right out of our little church because God seems to break revivals out of little churches. Amen? <laughs> Who knows? And plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. And I think he's talking about Absalom here or Ahithophel or both of them. For you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? His feelings, his experiences deep down inside. Verse 3. Oh, send your light and your truth. Nice. Let them lead me. In other words, he's saying, I've been led by my depression. I've been led by the oppression of my enemy. I've allowed that to lead my emotions. Now he's saying, send your light and your truth and I'll be led by them. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. See, the holy hill, that's, that's got to be Calvary and that's got to be the place of sacrifice. Then I will go to the altar of God. To God, my exceeding joy. See that again? That keeps coming up to me. 
the exceeding joy, that I'm supposed to be having joy in my relationship with God. And on the harp, I will praise you, O oh God, my God. He's like, where's my guitar? <laughs> By the way, when you call out for light, when do you call out for light? When it is? Dark. <laughs> and is this world a dark place? Yes. We need to be calling out for light and truth. Verse 5, why are you cast down, O my soul? See, I think it's part of the other uh, psalm. And why are you disquieted within me? Here it is. Hope in God. I shall yet praise him for the help of my countenance and my God. Sounds just like Psalm uh, 42, doesn't it? Well, there you go. Praise God. Amen. Let's pray. Father. We come before you in Jesus' wonderful name, thanking you for these three psalms. Thanking you for loving us and calling us out here this night. And I pray, Lord, that if there's any here that are in that place of struggling, where they don't know uh, what to do with their hurts and their depressions, I thank you, Lord God, that we could take them straight to you. And knowing that you hear us and you answer us, we can put our hope in you. We can praise you even now because, Father, because of Christ, you are smiling at us. That's your countenance towards us. Bless each and every heart. I ask this in Jesus' name. And all my sweet brothers and sisters say, Amen.